Neither the first two chapters so far. Um, but we are not in the book of 1 John. We are in the book of Jonah. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to the book of Jonah. Jose doesn't want me to mention the page number this time. Uh, so just find Jonah somewhere in your Bible. If you open up to the middle of the Bible, you should be in the book of Psalms. Start heading to the right past Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and the Song of Solomon. Get into the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. After Daniel, slow down because those books aren't as big. You got Hosea, then Joel, then Amos, Obadiah is tiny, then Jonah. And if you reach Micah, you've gone too far. So Jonah. If you're Jose, you've already got the page open to it. I don't even have to mention it. 1856. All right. So the book of Jonah. We don't really know who wrote it. It's kind of a strange book because all of the other minor prophets are like prophecies, right? They're the, they're, they're the message from the prophet to the people, usually of Israel, sometimes of Judah, um, and very occasionally to the other nations. Jonah is not prophecy, even though he's a prophet. It's a narrative. He's writing a story about this event that happened to him, and I think Jonah wrote it. Because there's some very personal stuff in here that if Jonah didn't read it, they must have interviewed Jonah or something to get this information. Uh, so me and most of the scholars that I've, I've read uh, agree that Jonah is the author of this book. There are a lot of people who say that Jonah didn't write this book, that this was just a, a story that someone made up uh, long after this time has passed. But we know Jonah was a real person. We have more information about him than we do about Amos and more about them than we than Obadiah, because we don't even know which Amos it was and which Obadiah it was. We know who Jonah was. It says Jonah, the son of Amittai. And we see in 1 Kings chapter 14, I think it's like verse 26, it mentions Jonah, the, verse, the son of Amittai, and some prophecy he gave about Jeroboam II becoming king. And it came to pass, just as Jonah, the son of Amittai, prophesied. He's a real guy. And there are many other ways to talk about Jonah. It's like, to say it's true, like whether you want to talk about the fish. So you'd like to argue, is it a fish or is it a whale? And, and the answer is, who cares? I mean, like back in the 1800s is when we said, okay, some things are whales, some things are fish because they're mammals, because, you know, they give live birth and they don't have eggs and they feed milk. I don't know how whales feed off of their mother in the ocean. That's kind of weird. But sure, they do that, right? But before that, everybody just called anything in the ocean a fish. And we have to remember that, that man names things differently than, than what God's named them originally. And so if you're going to argue, is it a whale, is it a sperm whale, is it a whale shark, is it, what, what could it be? Those are the two guesses, by the way, sperm whale or whale shark, if you're into this sort of thing. And I kind of think it's fun, but I don't want to dwell on it too much and argue it, um, because it's not, it's not worth it. The point is, God did it. It's a miracle. And if God could create the heavens and the earth, he could prepare a fish big enough to swallow Jonah and spit him back out three days later. And like, that's it? If you want to argue about it, like, well, it can't be scientific because this happened. It's like, well, there are instances where fish do swallow people. We haven't seen them spit any back out. But they do swallow them whole, and you cut them open, you could get the person out still alive, kind of. It's gross, but you could, Right? But the point is, there's a difference between miracles and science. God has set in motion this law of physics that we study. We don't create the laws of physics. We study the laws of physics. When someone uh, comes upon one of the laws of physics, like gravity, they don't invent the law of gravity. No one invented. They discovered the law of gravity, right? Newton is... Uh, Sir Isaac Newton is, is credited with discovering the law of gravity. It was already there. It already existed. He just figured out how it works and gave it a name. That's what it is. It's gravity. What's gravity? I don't know. I mean, I do know. It, what it, gravity is, is two objects are attracted to one another. Like they just start coming together. And the bigger they are, the more they, are, the, the more they attract objects to them because they're too big to move to some, somewhere else, I guess. But why? 
How does it work? We don't know. We don't know. It just works. It also happens with uh, the strong and weak nuclear forces, right? If you think of the smallest thing we know of is, 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 is a molecule, or sorry, is an atom, and atoms got parts. We know of three smaller parts that make an atom, the protons, the neutrons, and the electrons. And anyone who's been through a high school science class or maybe even the junior high science class knows that the neutrons and the protons are in the middle, in the nucleus, and they're stuck together, and the electrons are whizzing around them, Okay. The weak nuclear force is whatever force it is that keeps the electrons spinning around the, the protons. That's called the weak nuclear force. The strong nuclear force is whatever keeps the protons and the neutrons together because protons um, repel each other. They want to go away from each other. But something is stronger than that, and it holds them together. They call it the strong nuclear force. You guys know what the strong nuclear force is? Nobody does. It's just a name we give to that because we don't know what it is. Scientists are so good at that. They find something, they don't know what it is, they gave it a name, and now they're all smart. You guys know what dark matter is? Nobody knows what dark matter is. What happens is they have some scientific readings, and then it's not explained by any matter that they know of, so they just call it dark matter. What's that? It's dark matter. What's dark matter? I don't know. Nobody knows. But I have a name for it, so I'm not worried about it doesn't bother me anymore because it's named dark matter. But what miracles are, and I will tell you what miracles are. Miracles are when God puts aside the rules that he has set up for nature and says, now I'm going to do something different. And he's allowed to do that. He sets the rules. If I make a rule that my kids, you may not eat in your bedrooms, am I allowed to change that rule for a night? It says, okay, special night, you can eat in your bedroom this once. That's allowed. I'm the dad. I make the rules, right? They can't change the rules. They can't break the rules. I can because I made them. God made the rules of nature. God made the law of nature that we discover he's allowed to break it. He broke it so many times. And here in the book of Jonah, he performs miracles. And it's wonderful. And the more we look at the Bible, the more miracles we see anyway. So why are we surprised at this? But this book is attacked because they, they, they appeal to our scientific nature. It's like, well, that doesn't make sense. A person can be swallowed by a, a fish for three days and spit out on land. But they remember, well, God did it. It's not like some random fish swallowed Jonah. God prepared this fish specifically for this job. Then he gave the fish a stomachache. And boop, he threw up Jonah. And so, and we'll get into why over the next few weeks as we, as we study the book. But I, I, I want us to remember that God is God and we are not. And he can do anything, and he does do everything that he wants to do. Whether or not it follows the laws of nature that he set up, he can suspend them and perform miracles. Crossing the Red Sea, miracle. We don't have to try and explain that scientifically. The ten plagues of Egypt, miracles. We don't have to explain that scientifically. Everything that Jesus did, we don't have to explain any of that scientifically. We don't like, well, how did he take the, the, you know, the bread and he multiplied to feed 5,000 people? Maybe there was like secret bread somewhere that his disciples were. We don't have to explain that. It's God did it. Jesus rising from the dead. They have tried to explain that one away since the day he did it. They have never succeeded. If you want to watch a good movie or read a good book on it, The Case for Christ is an excellent one. The Case for Christ, actually, I didn't read the book. Uh, I, I plan to. It's on my shelf waiting for me to get to it. But I did watch the movie because it's a lot shorter than reading a book. It's about this guy who's, who's, a, who's a journalistic uh, investigative reporter. And his wife becomes a Christian. And he hates it so much that he sets out to disprove Christ. And his buddy, who's a Christian, who works with him at whatever paper he works at, uh, he says, well, if you want to disprove Christianity, all you got to do is disprove the resurrection. If you can disprove the resurrection, all of Christianity falls apart. He's like, oh, that sounds too easy. Are you sure you want to, you know, give me this one? He's like, yeah, go for it. And, and, then, and he interviews witnesses. He looks over all of the evidence. And he becomes a believer himself. Did I just spoil the ending? I forgot to say spoiler alert. But I watch it. If you want to borrow it, I think I have it in the bookstore. Come talk to me afterwards. I'll let you borrow it. 
But you got to bring it back quick so somebody else can borrow it. Um, the main reason, though, that I know Jonah's true is because Jesus himself referred to Jonah. And he talked about him like he was a real person. And that's all the proof I need. And you might argue, well, Jesus that, you know, doesn't have all of the history and the scientific stuff that we have now. And I'm thinking, well, if you're smarter than Jesus, then, then that's a whole different discussion. Because Jesus is God. He knows it all. And if Jesus says Jonah's true, I don't have to go and try and prove it. I like to look at the other stuff. It's fun for me. But my, my, my heart's already set because Jesus said it was true. So, Jonah takes place during the time, around the time of Jeroboam II. He was a king of northern Israel. You remember after David, after Solomon, uh, the kingdom split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom had zero good kings, no good kings, all evil kings, all driving people away from the Lord. Um, and their punishment eventually, because we talk about all the time in, in the Minor Prophets, is the Assyrians coming to take over Israel. Take them out, take them captive, spread them out, assimilate them into their own culture so that they will be no more. That is Assyria's plan. And Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, is the place that Jonah is called to. Now, it's kind of strange why he doesn't want to go at first, and we'll get there. But then, of course, by chapter 4, uh, you, you find out why. We think Jonah wrote this book afterwards because who else would write this, and how humbling must it be for Jonah? Can you imagine? You guys have read this book, right? Being Jonah and having to write this stuff about yourself for everybody in the world to read for all of time. Forever. Like, that's one mistake. That, that he'll never live down. In fact, I think it's just prudent since it's such a short book. Let's just read the whole thing. It's only four chapters. The second chapter is only ten verses. Starting in chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Mattai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee the Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord, he went down to Joppa and found the ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God and threw their cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down to the lowest parts of the ship, had lain down, and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call, to your God, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us, so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know for whose, uh, for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Please tell us for whose cause it is. For whose cause is the trouble upon us? What is your occupation? And where do you come from? And what is your country? And, what, and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made this sea and the dry land. Then the, men who were, then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then he said to them, What shall we do to you? that the sea may be calm for us, for the sea was growing even more temptuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea, that the sea will become calm for you, for I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more temptuous against them. Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not per let us perish for this man's life. And do not charge us with the innocent blood for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly, and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. He has answered me. 
out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you have heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, as the, and the flood surrounded me, and your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The waters surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you, into your holy temple. Those... Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spit, spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. And he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a great fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent? And turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from disaster, and he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, oh Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under the shade till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah that he might be a shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm and so it damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat on Jonah's head so he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, it is, right. is it right for you to be angry about the plant? He said, Is it right for me to be angry? He, and he said, It is right for me to be angry even to death. But the Lord said, You have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, the great city? in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their left and their right, and much livestock. And that's the end. It doesn't say what Jonah said. It doesn't say what Jonah didn't say. It just ends here. Can you imagine being Jonah, going through all of this, and then getting a word from the Lord, write that stuff down. And give it to your people. This was written for, not for the Assyrians, not for the Ninevites. This story was written for the Israelites. To teach them to love their neighbors. That God loves their neighbors. God loved the enemies of Israel. He did. He does. And the people of Israel needed to know that. This world likes to pit us against each other. Us versus them. We're the good guys. They're the bad guys. But the truth is, God is the good guy. The rest of us are bad guys. 
We're just bad guys fighting amongst ourselves. We're, we say they're the bad guys because we think that they're worse than we are, but truly, none of us are good enough to get into heaven on our own anyway. None of us are good. So much so that when someone called Jesus a good teacher, he's like, why do you call me good? No one's good. Even though he actually is. But we call ourselves good. We call each other good because we want to feel better about ourselves. But the truth is, we were all once enemies of God. And God loves his enemies. He instructs us to love our enemies, but he loves them. Because while we were his enemies, God died on the cross for us. And the enemies that he still has, those, the, those of us humans who have not said yes to Jesus, God died for them too. God doesn't want anyone to die without knowing him. Does that mean no one will die without knowing him? No, obviously people die without knowing him. But that's not God's will. It's the one thing that he gives up control over, even though he is sovereign. God is completely sovereign, but he gives us free will. Figure that one out. And you get to choose. If the only thing you get to choose in your life, this is it, whether or not you follow God. You get to choose that. Nothing in the world can take that choice away from you. You live in America. It's freedom. You get lots of choices. You get to choose uh, if you go to church or not. Great. But in certain countries, that choice is taken away from you. You get to choose what you eat for breakfast. Great. Let's say you go to jail. That choice is taken away from you. They're like, here, eat this. Or in some countries, you don't get to eat at all. Choose what you wear. Not everywhere. Not everyone. Choose what you're allowed to say. Not everywhere. Not everyone. Choose whether or not you are going to be loyal to God. Choose whether or not you're going to follow God. That is your choice. No one can take that away from you because it's inside your heart. And even though Jonah was a prophet of God, he chose to run away. Not a smart guy, huh? And did, when you got, when I was reading that, did you think like, is Jonah like a real like guy, or is he like a teenage boy whining all the time? It's like, oh, I hate these guys. I knew you were going to be nice to them, Jesus. Oh, well, you didn't call him Jesus, but I knew you were going to be nice to them, God. But I wanted them to die, and now I could die because I'm so upset. It's so hot out here. It's almost as hot as Chico in the summer. I could die right now because my plant died. You know, it's just like, come on, grow up. You're supposed to be a prophet of God. You're supposed to have this stuff together. But he didn't. Not everybody does. And that's kind of relieving in the fact, because this guy was still a prophet of God. He was still used mightily by God even though he rebelled against God. And if you think, how could God use me? Well, you're not Jonah. You haven't hopped on a boat to try to sail halfway around the world just to get away from God, have you? <laughs> you, you didn't run into a storm and then a hungry fish, did you? And get spit out three days later, all right, try again. And his heart still wasn't right. It was like, fine, I'll do it, but just because you told me to, I don't want to. And he goes and does it. And then God saves the entire city. The entire city was saved. How cool is that? God cared about him so much, and Jonah cared about him not at all, but God still used Jonah. I found out a couple years later, after I gave my life to the Lord, that... <clears throat> I was kind of an accident, spiritually. You know how people are accidents, like, oh, my parent, the parents didn't plan to have you as a child, but they got pregnant, and oh, you're an accident? I was like a spiritual accident, because the people who shared the gospel with me were actually trying to talk somebody near me into the gospel. Like, they were trying to talk him into it, and he was a really intellectual type. And he's a Christian now. He finally gave, gave his life to the Lord. But at the time, he was, he was a proclaimed atheist. He would come to Bible study, 
And I got invited by I'll say too, just because I was, you know, they invited everybody. I'm like, yeah, I'll go. I have nothing else to do. And I was interested and curious. Uh, but they were trying to convince him to become a Christian because he had an answer for everything. And they would study all week to try to answer him. And I'm just kind of on the sidelines. And I end up giving my life to the Lord. And then, like, I didn't even do it, like, at a Bible study. I just told him about it later because it happened in my dorm room when I was by myself. You know, I just realized that God was right. And I'm like, well, if God's right, I'm stupid not to give my life to him. So I gave my life to, uh, my life to him. And then I told him about it later. And they, and they admitted in front of like 200 people uh, a couple of years later on that, that they didn't mean to, 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 to uh, I mean, I, I don't say they didn't mean to give me the gospel. They weren't trying to get me saved. They were trying to get him saved. It's kind of, I think I was like, like next, you know, like to get him saved and they'll work on me or something. I don't know what they were thinking, but it was just like, well, that, that, that feels a little less special now, doesn't it? That I kind of got the gospel secondhand. Uh, but I'm thankful for it. I still love those guys. I'm not a mistake in God's eyes. And I'm hoping you guys can see that. And I want you to know that you're not a mistake in God's eyes. And whatever mistakes you made, God doesn't care. He can use you anyway. You cannot break yourself so much that God can't use you. In fact, the more broken you are, the more, the more likely you are to go, okay, God, I give up. I can't do anything for you. You just have to do it all. And then guess what? He's going to do it all. Because that's what he's waiting for. He's waiting for us to give up. He's waiting for us to say, no, I can't do it anymore. You just have to do it. And then he steps in and he does it. God is amazing like that. He plans for stuff like that. And he wants you to know that he loves you. He wants you to know that he died on the cross for your sins. And he is down on one knee asking, will you be mine? And it is up to you to say yes. But it's not just once, it's daily. It's not like if you say yes to him today, you mean no tomorrow. But a lot of us do that. We say, okay, Jesus, well, I'll follow you today because I'm down and out. But when things start to get better, we leave him again and go chase after other things. Does that mean we're not saved? No. We have, we have another word for that. It's called backsliding. But still, that word aside, we need to be with Jesus every single day. What would it be like if my wife said, yes, I will be your wife, and then she marries me, and the next day she just goes off, does something, does something else with somebody else I'm not even involved? It's like, does that still feel like she's my wife? She's still my wife technically, but she's not acting like it, right? Like, she's got to be my wife, both legally, but spiritually and mentally and physically as well. And if we call ourselves Christians and we run off, are we still saved? Yeah, we're still saved. But are we really Christians? I don't know if we are. You know what a Christian means? A Christian, like technically the term means Christ follower. Are you following Christ? Are you doing what he tells you to do? Are you following in his footsteps? Because you know where his footsteps lead? They lead to the cross. If you've become a Christian to have a happy life, you've been sold something that, I, that that's not true. It's not about being happy. It's about being right and being true with the living God. And they get from life to heaven. Jesus himself went through the cross and through the grave. And I am so blessed to live in this country where life isn't that hard. But we still have to look at Christ and realize that suffering is coming. Persecution is coming. You look at the stuff in the news and like this, world, this country is falling apart. It's like, yeah, it's falling apart because it's not following Christ. And we are going to have to suffer because of other people's mistakes. Because that's what sin does. And other people have suffered because of our mistakes. Think of the ones you love and how you've hurt them because of the mistakes you've made in the past. And how they've hurt you because of the mistakes they've made in the past. And realize that you've done the exact same and worse to Jesus, but he still loves you.
He has not given up on you. And he's got a purpose for your life if you are willing to walk it. Jonah was not willing, but he was made to walk it anyway. How much better would it have been for Jonah if he just said, yes, Lord, and went and preached the word? He would have had such a better time. So now it's you, and it's your life. What are you going to do? Let's pray. My Lord Jesus, you are an amazing God. Thank you so much for this time that we could gather and read your word, that we could read the whole book of it in one sitting. And we are so thankful for the book of Jonah. As fun as it is and as great as a story as it is, Lord Jesus, we are so thankful that you have put that story in there so that we know how sovereign you are and how loving you are and the way you treat Jonah when he was rebellious against you. You would treat us the same way, Lord, even if we were rebellious. Your mercies are long, Lord, and your kindness goes far. And you call upon us tonight to come to you, Lord. And if there's anyone in here who has not given their lives to you, this is your night. Jesus died on the cross because he loves you. He rose again from the grave to prove that he is God. If you want to believe that for the first time tonight, raise your hand. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Maybe you're not here in this room. Maybe you're watching online or listening on the radio. And therefore, I can't see your hand, but God sees you. God knows who you are, and he knows your heart. He knows that you're not only imperfect, you're really not that grave a person, but you want to be a better person. You want to be more like Jesus. And if that's you, just pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I have sinned. And I deserve to be on that cross that you were on. You never did. But because you were on that cross, you took my place. You took my cross. You died for me, Jesus, so that I could live. So I want to live for you. Jesus, please take my sin away from me. I hate it. Cast it as far as the east is from the west, just like you say you do in the Bible. Allow me to be a new creation in your midst, Jesus. Allow me to be your child. Please be my father. Love you, Jesus. I pray this in your holy and precious name.